Uh, with this, uh, we move to the next uh, talk for this evening. Uh, uh, Anuradha, uh, do you mind sharing this screen? I guess you have all the permissions. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, um, let's take me full screen. Um, right. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, yes, and, yes. Uh, my slides as well. Uh, so yeah, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> and good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the, the organizer for giving me uh, the chance to uh, present this uh, uh, talk. Uh, I'm sure you are having a very uh, good meeting so far. So the title of my talk is uh, Observation and Astrophysics of Gravitation Wave, Current Status and Future Prospects. Uh, this talk is base, uh, mainly based on uh, the recent uh, LIGO Virgo Kagra collaborations population paper. Uh, the archive number is given. Uh, this is um, this is the latest uh, results uh, from the collaboration on the astrophysics of gravitation wave signals. And it's a 70 page uh, paper, including the uh, author list and the references, uh, but it has a lot of information. So I'll try to give you a condensed summary uh, of uh, this uh, re recent and interesting re result. And uh, if you want more details, uh, please uh, check this paper out. Um, all right, so let us begin. Uh, Right. Yeah. So uh, since the first discovery in 2015, LIGO and Virgo uh, detectors have been detecting gravitational wave on a regular basis. Uh, by the end of uh, two observing run, O1 and O2, uh, which ended in 2017, we had 11 compact binary coalescence, out of which 10 were binary black holes and one was a uh, binary neutron star, the famous uh, GW9. GW170870, for which we also had a long list of ob uh, observation in electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Uh, and then uh, uh, after, uh, after this uh, third observing, the first part of the third observing round, we, this number uh, went up to 52, uh, in which uh, we had 40, around 42 or 48 of uh, uh, binary black hole, two were binary neutron stars, and two were neutron star black hole binary. And just a few months back, uh, the collaboration has published their latest and third uh, catalog name as uh, GWTC3, which has 90 uh, binary mergers, uh, and out of which uh, 84 were uh, black binary black holes, two were binary neutron stars, and four were neutron star black hole binaries. Um, but on top of this, we also have a deep extended catalog uh, from the collaboration, uh, which known as, which is known as the GWTC2 2.1, GWTC which has a list of uh, subthreshold uh, gravitational wave event, and we also have an open uh, gravitation wave catalog uh, uh, from the groups outside uh, the collaboration who analyzed uh, the open gravitational data and found some new event. Uh, but for this analysis, uh, the, the the results I'm going to present, we are not including these uh, additional gravitational wave events because uh, the astrophysical inference uh, actually depends upon uh, the search uh, sensitivity and uh, it also needs a careful understanding of the selection biases. So to, uh, to avoid these complications for uh, in including these additional events which have different uh, search criteria, we are not including these and we are only uh, sticking to uh, the events uh, presented in GWTC3. Uh, this is the picture where we have all the compact objects detected so far uh, with gravitational wave, with electromagnetic radiation. And if you notice carefully that there is a dearth of uh, compact object between uh, the mass range of two to five solar mass. Uh, and this is formally known as the lower mass cap. And there's supposed to be a higher mass gap on the higher mass side, which is known as the higher mass gap, and actually understanding and exploring uh, these mass gap and relating it to the formation scenarios of compact binaries uh, is one of the open uh, problems in gravitational wave astrophysics. So we will see if we can uh, learn something about these mass gap using the recent uh, data. Uh, all right. So with these many uh, compact binary coalescence in our hand and these uh, many uh, uh, events, 
So the questions we are asking are the following. Uh, how these binary mergers form? What are the astrophysical environment in which these mergers takes place? Is there a lower mass gap? Is there a high, higher mass gap? Or um, if uh, the star formation rate, uh, what is the star formation rate uh, uh, throughout the uh, history of universe? And of course, with new observations, we will have new questions and we will answer them when the time comes. So, uh, so before we answer these questions, let, let, uh, let us uh, familiarize ourselves with, the, uh, note with some notations and uh, uh, terminology which we use uh, in gravitational data analysis. So this is uh, the, the typical gravitational signal uh, looks like coming from a binary merger. And uh, if, the if the binary was in quasi-circular orbit, uh, the gravitational wave uh, signal as observed on the detector will depend upon certain intrinsic parameters such as the uh, binary's masses and spins. And it will also depend upon certain uh, extrinsic parameters such as uh, the distance to the source, the inclination angle of the orbit and uh, uh, location of uh, the source on the sky, et cetera. Uh, but uh, for uh, the purpose of this talk, we are not considering the extrinsic parameter and we are only interested in the intrinsic one because these are the parameters which govern the astrophysics uh, of compact binary and its population. Um, it is also uh, very useful to define certain uh, different uh, parameterization of masses and spin uh, so that we can extract as much as information from the data. So here we are defining uh, chirp mass, mass ratio, which are uh, some combination of the two uh, masses. And then we have an effective in spiral spin, chi effective, and one uh, as effective processing spin as chi p. So, so we will be basically talking mainly about the inference of these effective parameters rather than uh, the individual binary parameter uh, because uh, it's uh, with the current data it makes more sense uh, to uh, have these parameter because these uh, give us uh, uh, a greater information as compared to uh, the individual parameters all right so what is uh, the analysis setup in glwtc3 we had events from all the three observing run O1, O2, and O3. Uh, this include 90 CVCs with P astro greater than 0.5. Uh, P astro is the probability of any event of being uh, astrophysical nature. And I'm not is it possible? Yeah. All right. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about uh, the detailed detection and parameter estimation of uh, these uh, system. Please uh, check out uh, Surubi's talk uh, uh, tomorrow uh, for more detail. Uh, so for the analysis of uh, astrophys astrophysical inference, uh, we are uh, taking a subset of these binaries with a false alarm rate uh, threshold of uh, 0.25 per year. Uh, but in at least one of the detection pipeline. And this leaves us with 67 uh, compact binary coalescence. Uh, this is a stringent uh, uh, far uh, part of we are putting, but this is to make sure that we have a high purity set of events uh, whose selection bias we understood. All right, and this also uh, makes sure that we have only one event out of these 67 events, uh, which may not be of astrophysical origin. However, uh, for the analysis, just uh, exclusively for binary black holes, we are uh, we are relaxing this FAR criteria, and uh, uh, we are using a threshold of one per year, and this leaves us with 60, uh, 69 binary black holes. We are doing that because, uh, as you know, we have detected so many binary black holes as compared to binary neutron stars and neutron star black hole binaries. So since we have a larger number of uh, binary black holes, we are, are co confident that with this uh, far, uh, with this uh, um, relaxed far, uh, far threshold, we will have a relative, uh, the background events uh, will still be remain uh, less than 10%. And we will only expect about uh, 4.6 events or so, which may not be of astrophysical origin. Uh, this is uh, this is the criteria. It's just because we have larger number of binary black hole in the pool. All right, and then um, 
in, in the analysis coming up, we are distinguishing between the neutron star and black hole just based on their masses. Of course, we know that neutron star and black holes are different because there are matter effects, et cetera, and black hole is just characterized by two parameters. But uh, since we cannot measure the tidal uh, deformity parameters of uh, any of the compact object very accurately, we are uh, just distinguishing between uh, a neutron star and a black hole based on their masses. And we uh, and that uh, the mass spread <clears throat> comes from the equation of state uh, measurement of uh, masses. We will talk about that more uh, in, in the later slide. So how we uh, analyze the data, we have a population analysis framework. I'm not going to go into the detail of this slide because it is highly mathematical, but in summary, we are using a hierarchical Bayesian approach to uh, infer the parameters of the population. So you may know that uh, we use Bayesian parameter estimation to infer the parameters of binary, such as masses and spin, but hierarchical Bayesian inference or hierarchical Bayesian approach is one step further where we uh, marginalize over the uncertainty of the individual binary parameter and infer the properties of the parameter uh, properties of the uh, model which is characterized by cer uh, certain parameter lambda this capital lambda so theta are binary parameter and lambda are uh, population parameter and often they are called hyperparameter so you can um, uh, you can think of uh, that if you have detected uh, a bunch of uh, binary signals all of these sig uh, gravitational signal will have masses spins etc so these are theta parameters and if we assume that the masses of these compact object follow a power law then the power law index uh, alpha will be uh, the model parameter lambda, which we want to constrain using uh, the data from the population. All right, so let's see what are these uh, model uh, uh, assumptions we have uh, so that we can at least have a picture of what this population uh, look like. So first is uh, the masses, uh, the ma so the masses of uh, neutron star, uh, so to to model the mass distribution of neutron stars in the population, we have two models. One is power, which is power law with a power law index. Another is a peak, which is a Gaussian uh, distribution. And actually this Gaussian distribution is uh, inspired by uh, the galactic uh, neutron star uh, mass distribution, which peaks around 1.3 solar mass. And both these uh, uh, models actually have a sharp minimum and maximum cutoff at their edges. And um, when we are uh, simulating a binary neutron star, both the, both the neutron stars in the binary are independently drawn from a common uh, neutron star mass distribution. And for black holes in neutron star black hole binary, the black hole masses are uniform uh, and we pair them with the neutron stars uh, uh, randomly. So these uh, models are are needed only for analysis exclusively focused uh, on binaries which contain neutron stars in them. Uh, next is uh, for black hole masses. So when we are interested in also exploring uh, the redshift evolution of merger, binary black hole merger rate, we are uh, using a fiducial power law plus peak uh, plus redshift evolution model. So of course, power law is a power law model. Peak is basically have a Gaussian component in the mass distribution. And we also have a redshift evolution part, which is characterized by uh, the, the parameter kappa. So if kappa is zero, that means that uh, merger rate is not uh, evolving with redshift. But if kappa is non-zero, uh, that means uh, the merger rate is evolving with redshift. And by constraining kappa, we will know uh, whether the redshift is evolving, with, sorry, with the, whether the merger rate is evolving with redshift or not. Uh, we have another uh, model uh, for binary black holes. If, uh, sorry, for black holes, if you are not interested in uh, exploring the redshift evolution, but more on uh, exploring the subpopulation within the binary black hole population. So for that, we have a power law plus dip plus break model. Uh, and as uh, Guillaume uh, talked about some uh, breaking, broken power law, it's something similar. So it's a broken power law uh, with that dip at, uh, at the positions, uh, positions of the uh, uh, breaks of this power law. And uh, 
this dip is characterized uh, by uh, uh, by a depth parameter a, uh, which is uh, which is uh, basically it's basically a notch filter uh, with a uh, depth a, and uh, the boundaries of this notch filter are uh, for, uh, are basically the boundaries of uh, the the mass gap at the lower side we are talking about, and uh, it uh, we also have a low pass uh, filter uh, at the higher mass side to basically smoothen out uh, the distribution of mass. So these, uh, this is um, this model we are ex um, invoking to to look for subpopulation. That means we are exploring a lower mass gap uh, in the in the mass distribution. Uh, we have two pairing probability uh, to pair uh, the black holes and form binaries. One is the random. That means any two masses are equally probable as as long as the mass of the secondary is smaller than the mass of the primary. And other one is the power law in mass ratio, which is proportional to Q to the power beta, uh, where positive beta means uh, we have uh, the unequal mass binaries are less probable to form binaries as compared to their unequal uh, as compared to their um, equal mass uh, counterparts. All right, so these were the masses. Uh, let's talk about the spin models. And for spins, we have two uh, uh, model. One is the default spin model, where we have the spin magnitudes uh, uh, drawn from the beta distribution and the spin tilts, uh, the angle between the spins and the orbital angular momentum are a mixture of isotropic and aligned uh, distribution and basically these isotropic and aligned distributions are inspired by the the spin uh, distribution we expect from different formation uh, channels of binary black hole. For example, if the binary is formed uh, in an isolation, then we expect uh, the uh, the spin tilts to be uh, approximately aligned with orbital angular momentum. And if the binary was formed in a dynamical uh, environment, then the spins will be um, isotropically distributed. So to explore those uh, types of uh, formation channels, we have, uh, we, we have a mixture of uh, these two uh, distribution. The other uh, spin model we have is uh, the Gaussian spin model, uh, where uh, we have a bivariate Gaussian in chi effective and chi p. And if you remember, chi effective and chi p are two in spiral, uh, sorry, two effective spin, uh, which we uh, we have uh, defined in terms of masses and spins uh, of the individual uh, parameters. All right. So with, we have these uh, models, these many models, but actually there are more. And uh, uh, and with uh, using the data, let us see what kind of astrophysical inference we can make about uh, the population. The first in line is the merger rate. Um, this is uh, the merger rate numbers given in per giga per sec cube per year. Different uh, rows are for different uh, mass spins and uh, different columns are for different uh, mass distributions, like the different models for masses we used. All these numbers are uh, given except for the last row uh, are at 90% credible uh, interval. And the last row is actually the union of uh, the previous three numbers uh, in the previous three rows. So this is actually the first self-consistent measure of merger rates uh, the, uh, the collaboration has done uh, for all detected CVCs. Uh, here uh, we have subdivided uh, these mass spectrum into uh, astrophysically interesting mass ranges. Uh, for example, binary neutron star, binary black hole, black hole neutron star binary, or we are also uh, seeking the merger rate uh, of object in the mass gap. And by the way, this is uh, these are uh, constant two moving volume merger rate density. Uh, we are invoking uh, the, the evolution of merger rate uh, when we are only talking about the binary black hole and which uh, we will come uh, later. So the highlight is that the uh, binary black hole merger rate are consistent with previous published results. Uh, but if you uh, see uh, that the numbers in the BNS and NSBH uh, uh, column, the, the merger rate numbers are very different uh, for different mass uh, uh, models. And uh, this is because these uh, mass models give you a very different 
mass distribution between one solar mass to 2.5 solar mass. And this is basically, we have a very few, uh, bind few uh, binaries with neutron star in them. I think we can count that, I think six or uh, five or six. So having these uh, very small number of uh, binaries, uh, we have uh, the, num the merger rate uh, are very uncertain for them. And this actually highlights the importance of modeling systematics when we are drawing inference uh, uh, of a population with a very few number of uh, members. So we hope that in future, uh, these numbers will uh, have less uncertainty and we arrive at uh, some uh, common ground for all uh, the mass distributions we choose. All right, so then uh, we talk about uh, the lower mass gap a bit. Now let's, uh, uh, let's see what it is. So um, from, the, from the theory side, from the theor uh, neutron star theoretical uh, modeling, uh, 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 people say that a neutron star cannot be uh, heavier than three solar mass because it, it won't be uh, stable. And from the observation side, we actually have neutron star as heavy as 2.1 solar mass or so, but there is also some claims about uh, having a neutron star of uh, uh, 2.7 or 2.8 solar mass. So we have not detected from the electromagnetic observation side any neutron star heavier than Two point something solar mass or so. Uh, before the gravitational wave detection, uh, the only um, observation of black holes we had was from X-ray observation, and even there, we didn't detect any black hole below five solar mass. So it uh, so there was a, a claim that uh, there is a lower mass gap, which means that black holes cannot be. Uh, of mass uh, less than five solar mass. And actually there are population synthesis model as well with rapid supernova instabilities, which predict that black holes cannot be formed uh, below five solar mass. So with these uh, theoretical and observational consideration, uh, one can expect uh, uh, not to observe uh, binaries with component masses between five, three to five solar mass in gravitational wave, uh, if we assume that they are formed in the similar manner as uh, in the as we have observed them in electromagnetic radiation. So again, uh, this is a very uh, hot topic. We don't know yet uh, whether this uh, lower lower mass gap is real or not. And more observation will shed more light on that. But let's see what uh, the gravitation wave uh, observation tell us about uh, this lower mass gap. So we actually do find uh, a reduction in rates. Uh, above the neutron star mass uh, masses. So this is uh, the merger rate uh, between two to, I think two to five uh, solar mass or so. Uh, there is a reduction, but uh, we cannot confidently uh, infer the presence and absence of a subsequent rise in um, merger rate because the, because the errors are so high uh, and we, can, uh, we cannot rule in or rule out uh, the existence of a two-sided lower mass gap. Uh, but we do see that uh, the, the, mass, uh, the merger rate in the mass gap is one to two order of magnitude smaller than the uh, merger rate uh, on the rest of the masses. So it may indicate that uh, we have a two distinct population of compact objects. Um, but again, since the error bars are so high, we cannot say anything for sure at this moment. Uh, how, uh, However, if there is a lower mass gap, it may not be totally empty because there are many possible ways to populate this, uh, this lower mass gap. For example, the remnant of binary neutron star will produce a black hole, which will fall into uh, the lower mass gap. Uh, the hierarchical merger of stellar few body systems can give you a black hole um, uh, in the mass gap and primordial black holes, as we, we said, they form uh, uh, black holes at all the scales, so these can uh, the lower mass gap can be filled uh, with primordial black holes as well. Uh, and these are uh, very interesting and um, important to understand because the pres uh, the secondary of uh, GW nineteen or fourteen is actually lies uh, has a mass of two point six or so, and this lies right at the lower mass gap. So we don't know whether this is the lightest black hole or the heaviest neutron star we have detected so far. Um, all right, so this, is, uh, this was all about uh, the merger rates across uh, different types of uh, CBCs. 
uh, let's see uh, what we have learned ab ab about the masses. And first in line is the neutron star masses, and we will come for black hole masses afterwards. So, as I said uh, briefly before that, how we, we are distinguishing between a black hole and a neutron star just based on their uh, masses. And we, we say a compact object, a neutron star, when the probability uh, of having the mass is, uh, if the probability of the pro probability of uh, having that compact object mass less than the mass of maximum uh, uh, maximum mass uh, given from the POV calculation is greater than 50%. And uh, this uh, maximum mass has been computed uh, using uh, data from pulsar timing array, gravitation wave data, and X-ray observation of neutron stars. So if any of these, uh, any of the compact objects have masses below this mass, they will be called as a neutron star. And when applying these criteria, we found these many events uh, which have a neutron star in them. And uh, there are two binary neutron stars and there are four neutron star black holes. Uh, we also analyzed uh, GW190F14, but uh, uh, we found it to be not belonging to any of these uh, categories. So this is neither, an, if this is of course not a binary neutron star, but it is also not a neutron star black hole binary. Uh, so, uh, let's uh, see what kind of mass distribution we get with this handful uh, uh, number of uh, neutron star, uh, handful number of events uh, in which neutrons, there is a neutron star. So uh, the power law index in the power uh, model is uh, comes out to be uh, minus two point uh, something. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the, the mean and the standard deviation is about 1.5 uh, and 1.1 uh, solar mass or so. So we see that uh, with gravitation wave observation, uh, we don't see uh, uh, a peak in the mass distribution. Uh, these are uh, rather flat. If you the, the orange line and the blue line are flatter than uh, what we get from the uh, galactic neutron star um, mass distribution, which peaks around 1.3 solar mass or so. Uh, and one thing also we noticed from gravitational wave observation is that uh, we have support towards the higher mass of the neutron star, which is also kind of consistent with the galactic neutron star mass distribution because we do have a secondary peak uh, at the higher mass side. Uh, so this is kind of consistent, but the only difference here is that we don't see a prominent peak uh, in the mass distribution as we had from the galactic neutron star distribution. Um, then uh, the analysis we did uh, with this uh, uh, mass model, we found that uh, GW190814 is an outlier uh, from the secondary uh, masses in VNS and VNSVH. VH. So what has been plotted is the maximum mass uh, of a secondary after two uh, BNS observation and three NSBH observation. And uh, we found that the distribution of that maximum mass is no way near the observed mass of the secondary of uh, 1908-14. And there is only 0.1% chance uh, that uh, the secondary could be a neutron star. So from this analysis, we found that uh, uh, the secondary of uh, GW 1914 is an outlier. It doesn't belong to the rest of the uh, events uh, we have found so far. So next is uh, the black hole masses. Uh, and let me remind you that for this analysis, we have relaxed our far uh, threshold. We have used uh, one per year uh, false alarm rate. And we are, also, uh, uh, we are also considering the redshift evolution of the merger rates. So, I think I'm running late, so I'll, um, I'll try to go fast. Um, so first, uh, first result from this analysis is that the mass distribution is consistent with the prediction of GWTC2. Uh, what is shown here in black is the prediction from GWTC2, and the blue uh, regions are events detected in O3b, and they perfectly lie on the uh, on the on uh, the black lines. The two uh, uh, blue regions you see are from the two uh, neutron star black hole uh, binaries we detected. And of course it is expected because they don't belong to the BBH uh, population. So it is okay if they are not uh, falling in, in the black controls. 
uh, we have uh, over densities in the chirp mass distribution and actually uh, uh, component mass distribution as well. So what is shown here uh, is the the, obs uh, the observed distribution of chirp masses. And we see that there are different peaks at different chirp masses. And uh, we found that about one eighth of uh, the events have their chirp masses between eight to 10 solar mass. So it can, uh, it can very well happen that, of course, this uh, chirp mass distribution is following a power law distribution, but it could also indicate that we have subpopulation of uh, binaries, which are uh, giving you uh, giving us this, uh, these uh, peaks. So we don't know because again, uh, the error bars are large, but we did see this kind, these kind of over densities in GWTC2. And now we are confirming again in GWTC3 that these uh, peaks are robust. So it's, it's good that we, uh, uh, we analyze them in more detail. Uh, the, this is the power law model for the component mass uh, M1. And uh, we see that it decays more rapidly than what is predicted by uh, GWTC2, which is expected because uh, in O3B, we had a lot of uh, low mass binaries, which uh, increased the probability at the lower mass side, and hence uh, it has to decay at the uh, higher mass side. Uh, we now have a less peak uh, distribution of the mass ratio. So now mass ratio is not uh, heavily peaking around uh, equal mass side uh, uh, because, and the, and the reason is that we have detected many unequal mass binaries uh, in, in, the, in GWTC3. Uh, the other important result is that we have inconclusive evidence for an upper mass cap between 50 to 150 solar mass. So uh, what is this uh, upper mass cap or high mass cap? Actually, there, there are theories which which predict that if you have a, a, a star, if you have a carbon oxygen core uh, burning, whose uh, mass is about 100 to 130 solar mass or so, then the, uh, the gamma rays are so uh, energetic that they produce uh, electron and positron prayer. And uh, then the star goes into a series of contraction and expansion. And in every cycle of uh, contraction and expansion of the core, the, the, uh, the star loses some mass. And when uh, at the end the the core collapse supernova happen, uh, the 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 star is star's mass is only about fifty solar mass or so. It cannot have masses uh, uh, above fifty solar mass. So the remnant at the end you get as black hole will have only fifty solar mass or so. Uh, so this is called a pulsational pair instability supernova. Uh, but if the mass of the core was larger. Uh, than 130 solar mass or so, then uh, after the supernova, it, will, it won't leave any uh, remnant. And that means that we will not have any black hole uh, formed if the star goes into a uh, pair instability supernova. So if you have a pulsation pair, pair instability supernova, you will expect masses of black holes uh, to pile up around 50 solar mass. Or if, if, the, if the star uh, goes into parent stability supernova, you won't expect any black hole. So that means that we would expect uh, uh, a gap of, of, uh, in masses about 50 solar mass and 150 solar mass. So this is uh, the so-called higher mass step. And let's see what data tell us. So uh, as I said before, we, don't, we have inconclusive evidence for the upper mass gap uh, because in, a, in the analysis, uh, the gap was defined as a rapid decline and a rapid rise in merger rate. And we didn't find uh, any such uh, decline and rap uh, and rise in the merger rate around the high mass cap uh, around the yeah high mass cap. So it could mean that um, the uh, the higher mass cap uh, uh, starts from uh, masses uh, above what is expected from the theory, or it could mean that uh, uh, the high mass binaries observed in TC GWTC three could have been formed uh, from other ways. Uh, which avoids uh, the parent stability supernova. So, and this is because we do see uh, masses uh, in the high mass gap. So what are the other ways to form uh, 
uh, to form these uh, uh, black holes. So there are many possible ways, of course. First is the hierarchical Barney black hole merger, and uh, they can produce uh, heavy uh, black holes. So I would um, request you to please check out uh, uh, talks from Vishal and Parthapatin, which uh, they talk about the hierarchical merger of Barney black holes. Uh, stellar mergers can also produce heavy uh, black hole or uh, the black hole remnants uh, uh, of population three stars can have uh, high masses which lie in the upper mass cap. And there are, of course, there are other ways uh, to form black holes which will lie in the upper mass cap. So again, we don't know if there is a upper mass cap or not, but if, if it is, then it, may, it will not be totally empty because there are many other ways to form black holes in the mass cap. Uh, I'll quickly go over this, but uh, we, from the analysis of binary black hole only, we, we is again found that uh, GW190014 is uh, again an outlier uh, from the point of view of secondary in the binary black hole, uh, because I'm running out of time, so I will uh, skip this slide. So let's uh, talk about uh, quickly the rest evolution, uh, sorry, the, uh, the merger uh, rate evolution with respect to uh, redshift. So if you remember, the kappa was the parameter uh, which characterized the evolution of redshift, uh, evolution with redshift, and we found it to be uh, 2.7, so which is, which means, and it is also kind of avoiding zero. So this is kind of a confirmation that merger rate of binary black hole is indeed uh, evolving uh, with redshift. Initially, we did find this uh, uh, result, but uh, the we we still uh, the kappa was still consistent with zero in in GWTC two. But now in with GWTC three, we are more we are confident uh, that uh, the black hole merger rate are evolving because now kappa uh, kind of uh, avoids zero with ninety percent uh, credible interval. Anuradha, uh, yeah. you have five minutes. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll finish that. So let's then talk about the spin distribution of binary black hole. We talked about uh, merger rates and masses. So the, uh, the, the interesting result is that the black, binary black hole spin distribution are also consistent with the prediction from GWTC2. Uh, again, the, the black contours are the prediction from GWTC2 and the blue uh, uh, regions are uh, the events detected in GWTC3. And again, these uh, uh, outliers here are from BN, uh, NSBHS, so it is expected that they won't fall uh, into uh, the black contours. This is uh, the distribution of uh, the, um, the spin magnitude. And uh, on the, on the uh, right, we have the spin tilts. So spin magnitudes uh, are not very different. Uh, spin magnitude distribution in GWTC3 are not very different uh, from GWTC2, uh, but we do see that the spin tilts now have higher probability at uh, the cosine uh, minus one side. So it is, uh, we have excluded the case that uh, the spin tilts are perfectly aligned uh, with the orbital angular momentum, and we have more evidence that the tilts are isotropically distributed. Uh, this is uh, the distribution for chi effective and chi p. Uh, we find that the chi p, sorry, the chi effective distribution is centered around 0.06. Uh, uh, rather than zero, because uh, if the all the binaries would have formed from the dynamical formation scenario, then the chi effective should be peaked around zero. It is not peaking around zero, but still uh, consistent with zero. So it may mean that uh, not all the binaries are formed uh, through dynamical uh, formation channel. And uh, what we have observed is the mixture of uh, uh, binaries coming from different formation channels. And uh, we also have an evidence for the extreme uh, spin orbit misalignment. So the, if, the, if the binary was formed in an isolated formation channel, we don't expect the spin tilts to be go beyond uh, 90 degrees or so. So if we have a chi effective less than zero, which would, it would mean that uh, uh, the binaries were formed through, uh, some of the binaries would uh, form through uh, dynamical formation channel. So what we did is that we tried to uh, characterize a chi effective min 
using the Gaussian model, and we find that the minimum chi-factor we get is less than zero with 99.8% uh, credibility. So this means that uh, we have a strong uh, evidence for the extreme spin orbit misalignment. Uh, we repeated uh, this uh, analysis again because there was some objection about uh, this uh, calculation because they said that even when you don't include uh, uh, the secondary population and you don't allow the spin to correlate with other mass parameter, you cannot trust these results. So uh, we um, redid this analysis and we still found that the chi factor, the minimum chi factor is less than zero with 88.4% credibility, still uh, uh, very high. So we do have a strong uh, evidence for the extreme uh, spin orbit misalignment in, in the data. All right, so this is uh, the summary. I think I ran very fast, but this is kind of the gist of uh, the latest observational uh, astrophysical inference we have on uh, gravitation wave data. Uh, mass and spin distributions are consistent with GWDC2. Uh, more black holes are preferentially negatively aligned uh, uh, with respect to the orbital momentum. It could be by chance as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and maybe a future observation will uh, 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 rule in or rule out. Uh, Mercury density is increasing with redshift. Uh, there is a relative dearth of observation uh, of component masses between three to five solar mass. So it may indicate that uh, there is a lower mass cap, but we cannot say it confidently, at least currently. Uh, there is, um, so again, there's no strong evidence for lower or higher mass cap. Uh, the neutron star mass distribution is uh, rather flat as compared to the uh, uh, neutron star distribution from the galactic neutron star binaries. And GW190814 is an outlier uh, for the secondary mass uh, of any type of uh, binary uh, mergers. So just to go uh, forward, I'll, I, this is my second last slide. So we have... Uh, just started uh, doing gravitation wave astronomy and astrophysics and we are here. So this is just the five years of data. We have 100 uh, events and you see that how much information we have gained uh, from just these 100 events. And uh, we have a long way to go. And uh, with uh, future uh, more sensitive detectors, we would expect to have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, mergers observed uh, every year. So we, have, we hope that uh, uh, with more observations, uh, they will tell us, uh, shed more light on their astrophysical origin. And uh, we do have uh, many uh, uh, future detectors uh, in line. For example, uh, the just the LIGO Virgo Kagra uh, at their design sensitivity can see, uh, uh, can see binaries up to redshift of one. Uh, Voyager type detectors can see mergers up to redshift 10, 10, and the third generation detectors like the uh, Einstein telescope and Cosmic Explorer can see up to redshift of 30, which means that we will see almost all the black holes in the universe and then, of course, learn, learn about their formations. And then, of course, we have other uh, detectors uh, which are space based, which will explore lower sensitivity, lower frequency sense. Um, lower frequency evolution of the binary and tell us more about what is happening at that uh, in that frequency regime. All right, so with this, uh, I'll stop and I'll be happy to have any questions. Thank you for running over time. Uh, sorry, sorry for running over time. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Anuradha, again for uh, winding up uh, within, the, within the time uh, that was allotted for the talk. Uh, uh, again, we have a uh, 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 few minutes for a uh, couple of questions. Uh, uh, okay, uh, again from the top, uh, Divijati, uh, go. Hi, Anuradha. Hi, Divijati. Uh, Divijati, please ask away. We can't hear you actually. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted a small clarification. Um, so in PDB model, this is basically um, including all the three types of binaries, right? I mean, um, BBH, NSPH, and BNS. Uh, so power law plus uh, peak uh, plus deep, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, and... Uh, um, 
for so if we only consider suppose bdh population then that model will also look like something like power law plus peak is it mm -hmm. yeah uh, okay okay so so these dip and uh, break etc have been introduced just to accommodate the neutron star as well yeah yeah okay and okay. also to see if there is any gap so yeah so this is from the just from the binary black hole thing and this is just power law plus there is no dip in here yeah okay okay Arun. Yeah, no, no, no. So thanks for a wonderful uh, talk and summary. Uh, my question is about 190917, which you uh, a couple of times compared with 190814 as an outlier, right? This is uh, so. Is, is there a sub threshold event? I uh, I forgot what was the what is so special about 190917. I think it's a high mass uh, ratio event. Uh, it's not a sub threshold event because uh, this uh, has to have a far. Sorry. Uh, less than one per year, but it is a kind of a, a high mass ratio event where the secondary is somewhere in the uh, in the mass cap. So comparable to secondary of the 1914 in sums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that brings me to the next related question. That so um, you know uh, yeah, so if you uh, so there are two events like 1914 in sums and uh, broadly where the secondary is in the mass gap. So does it uh, give us clues, according to you, about the dynamical formation of uh, binary neutron stars? If you, you know, I was saying if the lower mass gap is, stellar processes won't give you lower mass gap, then it would mean that 1914 and 1917 uh, could be uh, due to mergers of binary neutron stars in the past, and they are pairing up. So this could be uh, a hint of uh, probably global cluster um, formation of binary neutron stars, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah, so as, as I said, there, there are many possible ways to form a black hole in, the, in that lower mass cap. And one of them could be a hierarchical merger of uh, neutron star binaries. Uh, then you form a black hole and then those that black hole goes and form binaries. So, of course, uh, if we have more such uh, low mass cap object uh, in the gap, we, one can uh, do the analysis and see what, uh, what is the probability. And basically, we did that in our paper. Uh, we see that uh, it is kind of consistent. Sorry, my computer is very slow. So we did find that uh, the merger rate in the gap is uh, one uh, two order of magnitude smaller, right? So and they in the gravitational wave data analysis, we also see that the merger rate density is two to two two order of magnitude uh, smaller in the gap. So let me just uh, bring it here. Yeah, so this thing. So this is kind of consistent with our uh, 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 conclusion we had in our paper, but uh, I think one can revisit and see uh, with more observation how this number changed. Yeah, thanks. I think that was my question. Thank you, sir. OK, uh, thank you, Arun. Uh, uh, so we are, we are over, uh, over the time so i'll have to uh, switch to the next talk uh, thanks arunada again for a for an excellent summary of uh, the astrophysics uh, that uh, these gravitational wave observations have brought to us uh,